afternoon, everybody. Ryan Kelly, Ecuador Shores Realty. Monte Ecuador's number one top producing, most recommended expat realty company. And today we're coming to you from the law offices of Ingrid Rodriguez. So Ingrid Rodriguez is obviously our lawyer of choice. She is absolutely fantastic heavily and very well qualified. She specializes in real estate, visa, and corporate law. She has a master's degree. She speaks flawless English. She's the best of the best. And what we're doing here today, we literally scored a one-on-one -on -one interview with her to literally be able to go over everything that you always have questions about, anything from the regular subjects about how to buy property, what's involved, how am I protected, what about visas and CDs. We're literally gonna cover all of it. We're gonna cover a ton of ground. So this is also gonna be one of those videos that everyone out there is going to wanna to bookmark, save the link, download, what have you, because this is also gonna be one of those videos that you're gonna to wanna to go back on. You're gonna be able to see this and see that, so it's gonna be a wealth of information. Um, my only thing is I'm jealous of her view. I mean, this is gonna be an incredible view. Wait till you see what we're doing it right from the conference room with this view. So hey, without further ado, let's go ahead and meet Ingrid and we'll get started. All right, so without further ado, let's jump right into it and get to know this wonderful woman. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ryan. As I told you before, I really appreciate your time with me and all the effort you have done, and I really admire you in, in, all, in, all, in all the phases that you have been here. I'm an attorney in law. I studied in Quito, in one of the top law schools there. I'm really proud of it, to say that I'm alumni. And uh, I started my practice here in Manta in 2014. I, after I practiced some time in, in Quito, in, in other law firms, big law firms, uh, I've been uh, working and practicing in, as a paralegal uh, from 2007. So you can imagine I have 15 years already practicing. And now um, yes. I'm really uh, do doing a lot of real estate, visa, and corporate law. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Uh, last year in February, I merged with Esija. Esija is a huge law firm in Spain. Right now it's ranked top five among all the big law firms in Europe wow. with tech law. And we are growing, we are over 900 professionals around the world. We have offices in all of Spain, Portugal, all Central America, and most of the countries in South America. In Ecuador, we have four offices, Quito, Guayaquil, Manta, and Cuenca. And here in Manta, I'm the senior partner. Fantastic. <laughs> you, you've come a long way. Yeah. Hard, hard work, I'm hard sure. Hard work, yes. Absolutely. We have been working really hard so we can be in this position right now. Fantastic. With ethical work always. That's why I, I really like to enjoy and, and enjoy working with you, Ryan. Uh, well, I, and the feeling is definitely mutual. <laughs> I mean, for those of you out there, I mean, you all know us by now. It's one of the main things we, we really want to be able to convey. And the reason that sets it apart is because with teammates like Ingrid, Ingrid, I love her as a lawyer because you never have to wonder if it's being done properly, you know? I mean, Ingrid's the kind of lawyer that sometimes she'll scare me. She'll call me up and she'll be like, I don't like the way this deal is structured. I'm like, oh my goodness, what's wrong with it? She'll go, oh, it's okay. We just need to make changes. And even some of those changes that she's done in the past, like to you and I would seem like mundane. It's like so tiny, like why would you do that? It's just <laughs> because she wants to go so overboard to make sure that it's right for you and it's done for you properly that, I mean, she's always gonna look out for you. And that's one of the main reasons why we love working with Yeah, her. and that's, that's I think the reason that I'm right now part of a turning of over 250 expats here. And that number has been growing uh, these couple of years since I think the pandemic was one of the best years that we have here <laughs> and it was crazy yeah. but, uh, but people love to be in this area I, 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 am, I was born in this area I've been working in this area over 10 years right now and I love it and I know that Ryan loves it too and, and that's why I think that we have that that good uh, relationship in working and as, I, as he said I've been working with over 250 expats right now and I think they have my uh, my way to be as I'm really protector, like a protector of, of, of yeah, my clients. She's, she's like a mama bear of sorts. <laughs> like, don't mess with her. Like, yeah, she, she's good. Yeah, I can, I can be really, really rough. Uh, he, you, you, you call me once a pit bull. <laughs> so. Yeah, right. On a side note, don't play soccer with her either. She's, like, she's, she's a completely different person on the soccer field from what I understand. So, yeah. Absolutely. It wasn't become, if I didn't become an attorney, I was going to be a soccer player. So. Maybe the U.S. will, the U.S. team will be afraid of me at some time. <laughs> at some point, yes. All right, sounds good, sounds good. Um, all right, so we'll jump into some questions real quick. 
All right, so getting started, one of the first questions that we always get is, how is it different between Ecuador and back in North America? And obviously there's gonna be a lot of differences. Now, me personally, I think it's a lot easier. Uh, there's not as much red tape. And for example, even when you sit down here at this uh, closing table, when you're finalizing your deal, you know, normally back home, it's a stack like this. You know, you got carpal tunnel after signing all the pages for three hours and everything else. Um, closings are generally what, like, 15, 20 minutes at this table. It's Maybe less. Yes. Basically one, one paper. I mean, there's a few papers, but one signature. You put your thumbprint and you're good to go. Um, so it's definitely what's nice and easy. But all the other protections are basically still there as far as you know title searches and things like that. But it's done in a different uh, category. Can you explain kind of a little bit of the process, how the municipal takes over, that kind of thing? Yes, of course. Well, the, the difference between Ecuador and the United States that it, over here all the, the the jurisdiction belongs to the municipality of the city that you are buying. For example, we all, uh, Ryan sells a lot in the jurisdiction of Manta, so we work a lot with the, the municipality of Manta. Also, here in Ecuador, the principle of law, or law says that everything is public regarding properties. So, for example, the first thing that we have to obtain in order to proceed with the sales is the solvency certification that is issued by the Registry of Property, which is an office that belongs to the, municipal, the municipality of Manta. So once we receive that solvency certification, you can see all the information regarding the property. First, the measurements, boundaries, if it has any lien on it, like a mortgage, if it, any, if it has any lawsuit on it, uh, like somebody says that also belongs to the other party or something like that. Also has all the information regarding who is the owner, who was the owner, who was the first owner. And if it's an HOA, it has all the information regarding when it was authorized and right now how, it, how it's working. So it's a simple document, but it has the whole information that it matters for, for, for a purchase process. Gotcha. After we obtain that solvency certification, we have to obtain other certifications at the municipality, such as the value certification, and the financial certification, and the treasure certification. The value is super important to get because it, the municipal value will be always different from the commercial value. Nine of ten times will be lower. Right. Why is that? Because that's how they, the municipal calculate how much is worth the, the, the property for them regarding all the information that the builder give, gave them at some point. And also the value certification is important because it also it depends on the expenses be, uh, will be um, from, that, from that value. For example, let's say that a property is $200,000, the transfer tax will be paid from that $200,000. So it's 1.3% tax of, for the transfer of the property that it has to be paid by the buyer. That is the, the, com the, the common way to, to proceed here. And also notary fees and registration fees depends on this value. Once we pay the transfer tax uh, at the municipality, the municipality issues the financial certification will establish that everything is paid in full and we can proceed with the, pur the purchase. And the treasure certification also is very important because uh, it says if the seller or the buyer has any debt with the municipality. If it has any debt regarding property taxes, regarding patent taxes or something like that, the seller cannot sell and the buyer cannot buy. So, gotcha. so it has to be resolved. It has to be resolved before. So in other words, and again, following along at home, basically what that means is that you, when you receive your property, like when everything's registered to you and you, you're getting ready to sign on that, that final contract, the property is 100% free and clear. It's a blank it's, slate. It's, it's not like somebody can come back to you a year later and say, oh, you owe me this money. Yeah. Or the city has, oh, you owe me more back taxes now. No, it has to be 100% taken care of from the seller. So the seller, if he hasn't paid property taxes for three years or four years, he has to be paid in full in order to those certifications be issued so we can attach them to the deed. Once we have all those certifications, we also have to pay a fee to firefighters because of their services that they have to do at some point, but hopefully you don't need them. No, no. Yeah, it's like an insurance. <laughs> And we have to pay a little fee to provincial council. That is, is uh, that's how the city law established. And with all, all those uh, documents, we go to the notary, mm -hmm. and the notary we attach them and we perform like just like a contract, a, a, a contract that has all the clauses like price, uh, the legality of the funds, the measurements, boundaries, all the background, and everything has to be only one signature from the seller, from the buyer, and from the notary. Gotcha. Normally here, and something that I really need to explain is that notaries are not like in the U.S. Notaries here are uh, established by the central government, by the Ecuadorian government, in which they picked uh, a notary as a 
uh, a server, a public server, and in, he will be managing all the archives and files of that notary that he has now in charge. The notaries in Manta, there are seven notaries because of the population. So we are 350,000 uh, people right now, and then that's why we have seven notaries. I work a lot with number three or number five, depends on uh, the client, depends on how they treat us. Um, but normally they are good notaries right now, so hopefully they, they will keep in that, in, that, in that area. Once the deed is closed, the property belongs to the new buyer. However, in Ecuador we have a formality that is the registration of that deed before the property registry of the city. This is important because, as, as you recall, the solvency certification is issued by that uh, direction of the, right. the municipality, so we have to update it. And that, that will be charged a fee also for that. So right. that is the whole process. How long it would take? Tops two weeks. Manta is right now recognized because they have everything done perfectly. So it's extremely it, it, exactly. It's gotten a lot it's, quicker. Yeah, it used to be smooth. like you know four to six weeks, four to five weeks. Yeah, right and now, now it's, it's like boom, they're just exactly. I, I say two weeks because it's like so if something happens in the middle, but normally it can take less of that. Yeah. So it's it's beautiful. Gotcha. Right now. Yeah. So, kind of a couple of little quick points. The certificate of this event here that she mentioned, that's pretty much your title search, all right? So when you're wondering, well, hey, what about title? How does that operate? That's basically what takes the place of that. But again, the municipality is the one that actually does all that background for you. So they just kind of took away the title companies, the municipality handles all that. Um, and then in the registration process, it takes about a week, week to 14 days. Yeah, the days, registration process weeks. will take between 48 hours to four or five days. Okay, now in the registration process, again, you already own it. You know, yeah. when, when you sign on the contract, it's already yours. The registration process is where they actually put together your new deed. Your deed here is called an, an escritura. Um, and what's nice about Ecuador is that unlike other areas of the world, like some parts of Mexico, you're not leasing the land from the government, so to speak. It's 100% yours. That's always a nice little Yeah, and point the other well. tip is that it, uh, compared to Mexico, in Mexico, I think that you have a time frame to be owner. Mm -hmm. Over here is all the time. You 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 are the owner all all, all your life. Right. So there, there's no time frame. There's no time frame for being um, a owner here in Ecuador. Nice. And the other thing that you must know is that according to our civil code, uh, expats and Ecuadorians has the same rights and obligations. So there is no restrictions about um, ownership, ownership here right. for expats. So, which is also good because now anybody can be able to own property here. Correct. Now they're going to buy it off their passport, correct? Yeah. So of all their passports numbers. So when you guys come in, um, it'll be registered to your passport. Um, now some kind of we get questions of do I even have to be in Ecuador to buy no, a property? Not really. Yeah. So uh, with a part of attorney, fine. I can I do I I can do all the job like from the service certification, even the signatures, and even the registration. So you don't have to be here in order to be an owner. I had clients that they never came. Mm -hmm. that they never saw the, the, the property and they bought it online. Right. And they came like one year later. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Now, kind of jumping into, into power of attorneys, we're going to get a little bit more in-depth with that because it's something that we generally will always recommend to clients who are even 50-50 interested in purchasing property here because when you guys come in to visit, um, you know, you're doing all the property tours with myself or Martine or one of the other members of our team. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times they're like, well, you know, I have these three that I really want, but we're not just sure yet which one we want. Well, we got to fly back to, you know, the U.S. or Canada or wherever. Um, do we really have to come all the way back to be able to make a decision? No. So that's where the power of attorney comes into play. So she'll do a power of attorney for you. It's, correct me if I'm wrong, 300 for a single, yeah. 350 for a couple. Um, and what that does is it saves you from having to come all the way back, pay the money for the flights and the hotels and time off work and everything else, whereas she can literally just be able to sign anything for you. Um, now, of course, she still has to clear it with you of first. Course. She has to have that paper trail, <laughs> yes. so she's going to email you and, and then, translate. Yeah, and I will say, hey, we're ready to sign. Let me know if, if everything is fine with you because that's another big uh, point to, to discuss. Once we have everything ready, I have to tell you that we're ready because you have to send the money to the seller. In Ecuador, there's no escrow accounts. Um, unless you have heard a different thing, we don't, we don't have escrow. Like when you put a money on in a, like a, a independent account, we don't have that. What we have is like being a part of attorney, I can hold your money here and I can pay directly to the seller. But normally eight of 10 times, the money stays in the United States or Canada. You know, it's the, right. the money never comes. So you have to pay directly to 
the seller. So that's why I ask you if everything is ready for me to sign because you have to send the money and then I will sign the, sign the deeds. Correct, yeah. Um, and that's another big difference between here and back in North America. So again, just like she said, back in North America, you actually have escrow companies. So everything goes there and then the escrow company divvies everything out at the end. Here, they don't have that set up yet. So basically, again, with her power of attorney, she can hold and act as an escrow. Um, but usually, majority of the time, like whenever we're ready to go, um, Ingrid or myself will contact you and say, hey, here's the wire information, here's where you're going to send it. Um, but she's absolutely right. The majority of the time, the money's not even coming to Ecuador because even our local Ecuadorian sellers will still have a U.S. account. So they'll say, hey, I don't need it in Ecuador. I'd rather have it in my U.S. account. So a lot of times for you, it's just a domestic wire, super simple. Exactly. And all the expenses costs that I, that I will need in order to do the whole process, uh, I can be sent also with a, wire, uh, with a domestic wire to my uh, account in the United States. So you don't have that trouble to do an international. Uh, wire because I, I know it can be a trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know okay. it can be yeah. a big trouble there. Yeah, so if we can be able to help streamline it even within uh, Ingrid's office, of course, we're going to do so. Yeah. So next question is, how is there protection for new construction? Or how do we basically do different terms and whatnot? Because again, a lot of times deals are basically pretty easy. I mean, cash is king. The majority of it is like, hey, you know, I'm going to buy this property. Here's a little deposit to show a good faith and whatnot. And then whenever the, the final sales contract is ready, you're going to wire your money in, everybody's going to sign, and good to go. Let's go pop the bottle of champagne. <laughs> um, but what if it happens to where you're buying a new a new building, uh, Grand Bay Mont, uh, Scorpios, um, you know, some of these other new buildings that are coming up, or what are you doing if you're working with one of our builders? Like, you know, we've helped you find a beautiful piece of land overlooking the ocean or in a beautiful native neighborhood, but now we need to be able to find a good quality builder to be able to build that beautiful home for you. So what you're going to do is you're going to do what's called a promessa. Now the promise is something that Ingrid is going to be able to set up for you and it basically gives all the protections and all the line items as far as how that deal is going to be set up. So for example, you're going to be able to have it to where it can be as simple as payments. Like let's say that, you know, obviously there's not a lot of financing in Ecuador and just kind of chime in real quick. Um, financing, even if you can get it in Ecuador, which is really super difficult as a foreigner, um, but the interest rates are what, like 10, 12%? Yeah, it's 10% so, is too expensive. Yeah, you really don't want it. You're better off you know, getting a personal loan back, back in, in North America than using that to buy your property. But what if you just need to be able to sell a piece of property back home and you need an extra you know, 60 to 90 days to do so, then you can do a promessa or a private sales contract that would kind of itemize that. But the promesses are really there to be able to get even more detailed and any builder that you work with, any new construction tower um, or project that you're working with, they're gonna have a promesa that's gonna be required. Um, so if you yeah. can be able to kind of give us a little bit of information on that. The promesa is, a, if we translate it from the Spanish to English, is promise of sale deed. It is a deed. It has to be signed before an order because that's what the, our civil code says. In order to be valid, in order to be executed, it has to be done before an order. That obviously will have a cost because, as I told you before, in the deed, as a purchase deed, the value depends on the price of the, of the notary fees since it's central government that they are dictating how much it is worth. So, in the promise of sale deed has all the conditions about the, the deal because Ryan here, when he works his magic, he can get you, he can get you very good deals. <laughs> so he will have all the information regarding the property that any doesn't have any lien on it because well, at the moment the solvency certification will contain all the information regarding the lot where it's been built, the building or the house or whatever. So in in the in the premise of solvency, we have all the condition that has to be taken care of in order to be finalized with the pur final purchase deal. Normally, the builders, like in Scorpios, they have their own um, attorneys. So in this matter, it's like a mediation between attorneys. So the attorney will send me the draft of the promise of sale deed. I will revise it. I will see, I will give my observations. I will translate it to English because everything has to be in Spanish. That is, that's really good. That is really True, important yeah. to say. Everything has to be done in Spanish since we don't have an English as a second language here yet. <laughs> yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah. Correct. It's coming, actually. It's yeah. surprising how more and more you know, exactly. uh, Ecuadorians yeah. are now speaking English. Exactly. Yeah. So in, in that matter, once we have that, uh, the, 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 the promise of sale deed translated to English, 
I send it to my client so he can he or she can revise and I say, hey, everything is ready, let's do it and let's sign it. Then we'll do the, the deed, we we'll sign it, and then you have to accomplish your obligations such as paying the fee that they, you have to pay every every time that you have uh, agreed to. Right. And the builder has to build and finish the, the building as what they have offered. If they don't do it, then you can execute your promise of sale deed before a judge in which you're saying, hey, he didn't build something that I wanted in that, and it is explained in this promise of sale deed. That's why it's so important in this in this kind of right. project. That, that's your actual protection. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so that way, if, again, it's also good as a punch list as well. So let's say, for example, you have a house being built and you know the builder's gonna do all the regular stuff for you and he's gonna show you the renders and the plans, but you're like, you know what, I don't want that kind of granite, I want the upgrade, or I don't want that kind of floor tile, I want a different one. All that little stuff is gonna be in that permess also, so that way at the end of it, you're gonna be able to go right down through the list with that developer, with that builder, and say, hey, you forgot this, you forgot this, that has to be satisfied Correct. first. In, in, in the houses, when you build a house, instead of uh, signing a deed, a promise of sale deed, what I recommend is to sign a civil contract of construction. Private agreement, in, yeah. exactly. exactly. In the construction, yeah. we have all these conditions. It's the same like a promise of sale deed, but the difference is that the promise has to be done before an already, and the construction contract can be done only in a private matter, and it still is valid. But the thing is about this construction is, is is because you only you are the only owner with the with the with the building. Mm -hmm. In buildings like Scorpius that I always take as an example, that you have several owners mm -hmm. and several contracts, so they have to finish all of them. So that's why they do gotcha. promise of sale deeds. Gotcha. Okay. Now there's also a penalty clause in there as well. Of so let's say, for example, like what happens just what if? I mean, I don't think it's ever happened with anything we've done. No. We. As you guys know by now, we typically work with the upper echelon, so yes. when you work with us, we're not working with fly-by-night projects and developers, it's all people that have been around for a while. But just on the what if, like what happens if they hire you know, a, a guy to build something or whatnot and it's not done, uh, what can they do? Is there a penalty? Or? Yeah, the penalty clause, it can be done as what the client wants and what the, the, the builder accepts. So like However, but normally it's between like, uh, in construction uh, contracts is like uh, for every day of uh, behind the, the area in the construction mm -hmm. is like 0 .0, 0 0.001 percentage of the total value. Gotcha. So it will be like a $300, $200 thing. So it's, yeah. it's something to push to push the, the builder to say, no, I have to <laughs> hurry up. There has to be a yeah, bigger because, penalty. Yeah, yeah because I don't, bucks, wanna, yeah. I don't wanna lose 300 bucks yeah. a day. In the cases of the, the buildings that they have more more promise of sell deeds if they have to return all your money plus paying a 10% uh, fine gotcha. like, uh, of the total price That's for total. example it's five hundred thousand dollars they have to give you all the money that you already gave at that moment and plus 50k plus, plus 50k wow yes all right so developer wants to make sure he, exactly. he delivers <laughs> exactly. and they have to return all your money you know it's maybe they already don't have it but they have to do it they have to get it exactly yeah. all right so again so you're, when you're coming down here and you're buying properties that aren't yet built yet you're investing in one of these newer projects or you're picking up a beautiful home lot through us you're going to hire a developer builder to build your dream home you're 100 percent fully protected as well and again that's why i always call her <laughs> my, my pit bull yes. because she really is i mean she's extremely protective of our clients so, and, I'm on, yeah. I, I really like to read and when i perform my promise of sale deeds or when i perform my civil contracts i really need to have like a one-on-one -on -one con uh, conversation with my clients so i want I, the first thing that i ask is what do you want and how you want it so i can put it on the, on the instrument and the, and the document and then everything has to be signed and we have, I have been done these construction contracts lately with all the, all the builders that Ryan has introduced to the client and it has been done really smoothly. It's, it's crazy how it's been done so good and everything is... Yeah, it's been easy. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a, uh, past Monday I had a client that says it's, it, it's, it's crazy that I was expecting to something to not to be done. Yeah. And everything was so smooth and I already sold the house, you know, sold the yeah. house. So it was like, yeah, that's because we work with the right people. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's just like anywhere else in the world, even back home, um, you have to choose the right team. Um, and I always call us and our teammates with DSR, you know, combined with Ingrid, we're, we're the dream team. Yes. It's uh, it's really good and it definitely helps things go a lot smoother. Um, and yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't even 
count how many times we've had clients, even like sitting down at this closing table, yes. and we're done signing, and we're all like, you know, spitballing, just kind of having fun, and next thing you know, like, well, so what else do we have to sign? We're like, oh no, we're not. Nothing else, it's like, <laughs> you're fine. Just hanging out. All right, now one other quick thing, still kind of tied in with the premise is home inspections, because I know the home inspections are required here. It's kind of like an option. Yes. So how does that work? Yeah, over here in Ecuador, there's no mandatory law or norm that says that you have to do an inspection of the property that you're buying. Okay. Because um, in the in, in the deed, in the final deed, or the, in the final deed, there is a clause of acceptation. And in that clause says that you are receiving the property as what it is, and you are okay with it. So you're accepting the property as, as what it is in that moment. Gotcha. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get a home inspection. Um, as our company, Ecuador Source Realty, we have an absolutely massive and ever-growing network. Um, so if you do need a home inspection, it would make you feel more comfortable. By all means, we can easily help you out with that. We have engineers that are literally come out to the property. They normally charge between a dollar and two dollars per square meter. So if the house is 200 meters, it's going to be between two and four hundred bucks on average. Um, and they'll go through, they'll do a full home inspection, they'll do a, a full written report, everything else. Um, the only difference between, like if you're buying a condo, they'll do whatever they can in a condo and then they'll actually go down into the sub-level where all the columns are and they'll yeah. inspect that so you, you know, make sure that you're you know, good and comfortable with that as well. Alright, let's talk visas because obviously everybody out there always has questions about visas so we're yes. going to dive right into that. Um, now first thing I always like to point out to everybody, and Ingrid will of course do the same thing, is that you don't always need a visa. So we'll dispel that myth right here and now. Um, just because you're coming down and you're buying property doesn't require you to be able to get a visa. Correct. Uh, there's plenty of people, just as Ingrid has already stated earlier, that have owned property and they waited a year to even come down here and yes. ever see it in person. Like of they course. did it all through the power of attorney and DHL and everything else. Um, so the way that your visas work, of course, you have your standard uh, visitor's visa and then you can extend that, but I'm going to let Ingrid kind of explain that a little bit more. But just your regular touristic visa is good for 90 days and the clock starts and stops as you enter and exit the country. So if you're not gonna spend more than 90 days in the country within your calendar year, why spend the money on an additional visa, like residency or investors or anything else? And also it can yeah. hurt your, your pocket because if you get a residency visa and you're going to be here only for 90 days or 180 days a, a year, then you will allow, you, you can lose your, your residency visa because you're not living in here. Right. So why will you need it? The residence visa, I recommend it when you are planning to be here over eight months, seven months here. If your plan is to be here nine months a year, perfect, then you need a residence visa. But if your plan is to come to be here part of your, your life here, don't do it. It's as a waste of money and time. Then you will have to get all documentation again to have your residency again. There's no, there's no many restrictions in Ecuador to have your residency visa. It's fast, it's right. easy. Uh, but you have to bring documentations from the United States that are kind of a little bit hard to get. Moreover, if you're from, from Canada, because in Canada you don't have a postal. So I think it's a really good important thing to talk about an apostille. A postal is a legal, international legalization that it was signed like an international treaty where Ecuador belongs in the United States. However, Canada don't. So they don't have a postal. Right. So everything you have to legalize, you have to go through your foreign affairs ministry in Canada and then you have to take it to the Ecuadorian embassy or consulate. So imagine now that Canada is so big in geographically and then you have to go to Toronto or where or Vancouver or whatever, whenever, wherever is the Ecuadorian consulate only to legalize a documentation that is already legalized. But that's how it works because what it means to be legal in the United States or Canada doesn't mean that it's legal in Ecuador. That's why it's so important to apostle documentations. Gotcha. As I told you, the apostle, this international legalization, is only one paper that in documents issued by the state is issued by the uh, Secretary of State mm -hmm. and documentations from like uh, FBI, because you need an FBI background, background check, checks. it will be apostled by the FBI because they are federal authorities to do it. So normally bringing those documents or I'm sorry, to filing for those documents takes at least three months of your time. Mm -hmm. So imagine you do all that work and then at some point you, find out you, didn't need you, it. Will, list, you will lose your, your residency <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. because yeah. you won't be here. So right. you have to do all over again to get your residency mm -hmm. here. So you're, if you're planning to be semi-retired and then retire full time and live here, then it's the time that you have to file for your investors or your residency visa here. So it's better just to wait. So exactly. it is, so again, yeah, to kind of review that, if you're only going to be spending here just a little bit of time, you're going to be bouncing back and forth to avoid the exactly. snow or something, 
you know, the hardcore winters, um, uh, then just skip exactly. all that, save your money. Yeah, because you can ex you also can file for an extension to your tourist visa for your 90 regular like days, that. for another 90 days. But the difference is that those 90 days, they don't stop when you leave, they will uh, still run. Just keep on running. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so that's technically, the you, they can spend up to six months here. Yeah. Just on visas. You can be here on, on, your, your, on your tourist visa, visa, visa for yeah. six months. Yeah. You have to pay with the, the, the numbers, that, with math, like when you have to get in and you, when you have to get out. And let's say that at some point you miss the date and you want to come here and you don't have any date left, you'll pay a fine right now. So they, they won't return you like right on date. <laughs> when he had his it's a visa. story for another video. This is before I ever met Ingrid, but yeah. Well, we'll definitely have to do another video. That was a funny one. So, yes. yeah. so <laughs> my advice is to have your visa only if you're planning to be here over six, seven months, eight months. If gotcha. you're staying here six months a year, it's not worth it. Trust me, you don't want to go through all the process. There are several offices here that can give you that uh, service. Mine as well. I can give you that service personally to you, to my clients. And we can help you with, assist you with that, even with the translations, the legalization of the translation of those documentations. I also work with a notary in Florida that can help you and assist you to get all your documentations there. If you don't know how to do it, I call her and I say, hey, I need to bring the marriage certification of Ryan. And she will get it. And she will apostle and she will send it to to my office here. Very nice. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Is it only for Florida residents that she can be able to help no, with? No, she can help with the whole Anyone? state. Exactly. Canada included? No, Canada. No, okay, because Canada she's in the U.S. It has yeah. to be the U.S. It has All to right. be in the U.S. Canada, we love you, but you know, yeah. talk to Ingrid before you do anything. She'll still help. <laughs> of course. Um, uh, but as far as U.S., so she can kind of help streamline. Exactly. So they can send everything to her. She can kind of do all the legwork and everything. Exactly. Get it all sent out. Collect the packet. Except FBI. Because Except FBI. The apostle, oh, the apostle is issued by the FBI as well. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. But she can help you with everything else, even okay. the translations. Wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic. Good help. Um, all right, what else? So we have the residency visa, we have the tourist visa, we've already covered that, we have your investor's visa. Yes. What about other... Uh, the other the type the, of... The, the other like type pensioners, of digital yeah. nomad. There's different type of residency visa, there, but the residency visa is right now split into a temporary and permanent residency visa. This is because after, before the, the change of the law, the reform of the law. Uh, people came here, get the permanent residency visa, get the cedula, this, which is the Colorado ID, and they left that with another ID. So, felonies were committed in, in other countries that were, were not Ecuador. So, Ecuador decided to give a temporal residency so you can see if you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So you can stay here for two years and then if you, if you decide to stay, then go for the permanent. If you wanna leave, you can leave. Gotcha. But it, they, Ecuador won't lose resources. Right. Yeah, you know. See, and, and that's actually a new thing because when Tiff and I first came down here, they didn't even offer that. So it was full blown residency. Um, now, with the residency visa, you'll have, you'll have to live here full, well, basically full time for the first two years. You're allowed to be out of the country for, for 90 days. Yeah, 90 per days year. per year Correct. for the two yeah, years. However, years. there's an exception, which is the investor visa. Mm -hmm. In investor visa, you can get in and get out anytime you want. Uh, there's no restriction, but in the moment that you are want to apply for the permanent residency visa, the law says that you have one of the requirements is that you have to be being living here for 18 months. So let's say that in your investor's visa you only were here 15 months, so you can file for an extension of the temporary residency visa, so you can accomplish the other three months, and then once you're ready, you can file for the permanent residency visa. But they won't take it away from you. But in the case of a pension visa or a, a working visa or a, a nomad visa, you have to stay here for uh, 18 months, the two years. If not, you will lose it. Gotcha. Now, let me ask you this also. So once you have residency, and you can come and go as you please, how long can you be outside of the country? So in other words, like, um, like certain countries might say, hey, if you're gonna have a residency in wherever, um, you can be outside the country for Five years, ten years, twenty oh, okay. years. Okay. Once you have the permanent back. residence. Yeah, yeah. Once you have your permanent residence, you can be out of the country five years. Five years. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Now, once you have your residency for that five years, or you know, come and go to please, whatever. But after you have a five-year residency, can you then apply for citizenship? Yes, of course. You can apply for citizenship. Citizenship here. You can have dual citizenship in Ecuador. It allows it, so you can be an Ecuadorian and a U.S. citizen, and you have an Ecuadorian passport as well. Gotcha. All right. So I'm sure everyone's already asking because I'm kind of asking too. <laughs> what are the additional benefits of being a citizen versus just having your residency visa? As I told you before, uh, you have the same rights as an 
Ecuadorian here, but with an Ecuadorian passport, you can be in the in all South America if without any visa or any other restrictions. You can be in Russia <laughs> without a visa. Right. So in other countries in in that in that area. Might also be good. Yeah. I mean, if you go to France, you'll show your Ecuadorian <laughs> your yeah. Ecuadorian passport yeah. out of your U.S. Um, but man, that's really cool. But you don't have to do citizenship. No, you don't. Okay. You can be only a resident here yeah. and live as a resident all the time. You pretty much have all the same rights anyway. Exactly. So yeah, so again, you don't have to become a citizen if you don't want to. I mean, Tiff and I haven't gone that path. Eventually we will. I kind of like the idea of having it. Yeah, he's more better than it. anybody else here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, now one more quick thing about the visas. When we're looking at like an investor's visa, one of the things that's become very, very popular, not just with investors, but everybody coming down, is that CDs in Ecuador, like through yeah. you know Jeff, and we have contacts in Jeff, by the way, to be able to help you, English speaking as well, That's good. Um, which is <laughs> definitely good. Um, but CDs are literally paying eight to nine percent. I mean, it's unheard of back home. So to be able to have that, it's a really great investment. So people have come down here and they'll go for like an investor's visa based on a CD. Yeah. So two quick things to clear. How much does that investment have to be to be able to qualify? And then what happens if they then cash in that CD after a year, but they still want to be able to have that investor's visa? How yeah. does that all okay. work? So in the investor's visa, there's two types of investment. One is with the real estate. That's also a good, uh, the importance of the value certification of the property. The value certification of the municipality will depend on your visa matters if you apply apply for investors because it doesn't matter if the deed says that the, the property costs you three hundred thousand dollars, but if the value or the municipal value says that it's only twenty thousand, it can it can happen. I can tell you that it can happen. Is not enough for your residency visa because the the authority will see the municipal value. So that is really important to know gotcha. that about the value of the of the so property. It's got to be worth at least forty five k. Exactly. Which obviously, if you're buying a home or condo, it's going to cover that. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but let's say CD, yeah, yeah, but let's say that you buy a lot uh, and you sure. do a house there. When you right. buy a lot in the rural municipal areas, value. It, the municipal value will be really like fifteen thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you gotcha. have to do a reappraisal of the property. Mm -hmm. So the municipality will. Bump it up. Exactly. Gotcha. So in the case of the cities, which is really good right now in Ecuador, there's a lot of credit unions here that are really important and big right now. It's like we work a lot with Jeb. I have a lot, several clients that already have their cities in there, only to hold the money that is for Scorpius, for, for Scorpius, for example. So they have the money here, but they are earning interest, 8%. Right. So pretty amazing. Absolutely. So uh, the, the, the other thing that you have to know that is Ecuadorian banks or in, in credit unions, they are they have a, an insurance about the Ecuadorian government that is only covers you up to thirty eight thousand dollars. So I normally have to t tell you to do CDs about forty thousand, mm -hmm. so you can keep. But in this case about investment, you need uh, an investment of at least forty five thousand dollars because our minimum wage already raised. So, so they'll they'll go over by seven thousand on yeah. that CD because it's got to be worth at least exactly. 45, but at least 38 is fully insured. Exactly. Um, and for those of you out there that want to do multiple CDs in order to be able to maximize your investment potential, then yeah, you would just work with um, um, uh, our contact over there, Jeff. Javier. Yeah, exactly. And then you'll do multiple CDs valued at 38, 38, 38, however many you want, and that way it's fully insured. Exactly. So, so yes, but, but now if they want to switch that, so let's say they have you know that one CD at 45 for their investor's visa, what happens if they want to cash that in and they don't want to do another CD? Okay, the thing is, uh, the CD has to be kept there for two years because that's what the law says. Gotcha. What happens if you cash it before, you will lose your residency. So you have to do all over again, all, all the process. Again. That means bringing all the documentations again. Gotcha, yeah. okay. So that's not something, it's not something that I will all right. recommend to so do. So now is that the same for the investor's visa? Same thing? Yeah. All right, so for those of you out there who are going to do the CD, just know that you're going to hold that CD in there for two years. Obviously, you're going to make good money on it. But for that particular um, situation, you'll hold it for two years. Correct. Now, after the two years, if they want to be able to move it out or do something different. They, they can cash it out. They can just cash it out. Then what happens to that? But, that they, have, they, but they have to apply for the permanent resi the residency right. visa. So they have to get the 18 months. And once they apply for the permanent residency visa, you can 
take the money out. Okay, so let's say that they get into a condo project or a new home or whatever, and so they want to take that CD or that residency or that investor's visa, and they want to move it now to that condo. Because now that condo is a $300,000 yes. condo, so that's easily going to qualify. And you can go for the permanent residency visa with the condo. Gotcha. So you can be able to help them just transfer everything, simple. Yes. Easily done. And also because one of the, the, the requirements for the visas, for any residency visa, is the background check. So if you already have 18 months here, or maybe more, then you will need the background check from Ecuador. And that background check is, get it, I can get it online for free. Nice, easily. Yeah. Free is good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so we covered visas too. All right, so there you have it. Um, a one-on-one -on -one interview with one of the top lawyers that we could ever have the pleasure of being able to working with and introducing you to. Um, thank you very much for your time. Oh, I mean, you. you're you, slammed all the time. I cannot <laughs> thank you. Oh, you got to give me a hug. Oh, uh, thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, she's absolutely fantastic. Anytime you guys come in, by the way, when you meet with her, she will do free consultations for all of our clients. So whenever you come in, even if you just want to kind of bend your ear a little bit, ask some additional personal questions about legal, yeah. visas, properties, yeah. anything else, we'll be more than happy to be able to schedule time for you. Um, uh, so that being said, we again, thank you very much for joining us on another one of these great videos. And this one wasn't property, but obviously it's a wealth of information. Uh, please continue to follow us on all of our social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, YouTube of Ecuador Shores Realty, and of course our custom professional website of EcuadorShoresRealty.com. And until the next video, we look forward to seeing you right down here in paradise. Have a great day, everybody. God, your office has the best view. I want this view from our office.